Good morning, everyone. My name is Esther Lisakowski. It's my pleasure to be here with you this morning on Thanksgiving weekend. Um, by the way, it's Thanksgiving weekend and you're all here. Thank you. You could be home with your family, sleeping in, having turkey and pumpkin pie. Actually, you'll probably do that in about an hour. So bear with me for the next 35 minutes or so. I hope that the message today will be something that you will take with you to Thanksgiving dinner and you can start talking about all the greatness of who God is. It's going to be a fantastic conversation. Um, but first I wanted to just say, um, for those who don't know me, I have the privilege of being able to serve here at Celebration for the last few years, and um, I serve along with my husband, and we have two little boys, George and Henry, and uh, we just wanted to express our thanksgiving to you this day. Um, I am just so grateful for a church family, like all of you who have become like family to us, to our family, and so I just wanted to thank you um, that this church has been incredible for that, and so I hope that all of you experience that same um, feeling of family and friendship that we have. So anyway, what I'm going to say today, it has really um, little to do with the Thanksgiving holiday. However, there is such a weightiness on this topic, I just cannot wait to jump in. I, I hope that by the end of this message, you as well will just be excited about knowing how to become like Him, and by that I mean like God. And we're going to look at um, some different um, aspects of God's relationship with us throughout the Bible and through personal experience. I think for me that foundational to our Christian walk is the need and hopefully the desire to know who it is that we serve, who it is that we worship, who it is that we say we love. And so to begin this, I thought that I would start with an illustration that is very relevant to my life and how I look at my relationship with God, and that is through the relationship that I have with my husband. And if, if you're not married, um, I just want to encourage you that this illustration is equally as relevant if you have children that you love, if you have parents that you love, anyone that you have an intimate relationship with, um, I want you to apply this illustration I'm about to share. So, um, first of all, I... I'm still there. Okay. Um, first of all, so my husband is Max. As some of you may know or may not know, he was a little hesitant to jump up on stage for this illustration. I think that's going to play very well into my illustrative point here um, because we are going to be looking at attributes of my husband. Now, <laughs> we're also going to be looking at attributes of God. And for those of you who do not know what does this word attribute mean, it's simply, as um, Tozer says here, it says, an attribute is whatever may be correctly ascribed to God. In other words, an attribute of God is whatever God has in any way revealed as being true of himself. So if that seems lofty, anytime I use the attribute, just thinking, oh, it's just how God has shown us himself. That's it. So um, jumping right in. So if I was to bring my husband up here on the stage, whether you know him or don't know him at all, you would immediately recognize probably his hair color, his build, how he walks up here, maybe his smile, some of those physical attributes without knowing anything else about him. Now, if you were to walk outside the lobby after the celebration and you see our two little boys running up into his arms, you would also be able to see very quickly that he is a wonderful father and a wonderful husband. He's very um, expressive in his love to us, and that is something that you will know about him whether you know him intimately or not. In a similar way, God has revealed himself to us in nature. And in nature, it doesn't take us long, whether you know God or don't know God, it doesn't take us very long to walk out into nature, especially in the fall weather where the leaves are changing color, the gloriousness of God is revealed to us, and you can walk to the ocean, you can walk in the mountains, and very clearly, God is at work. You can see, as I say here, His majesty, His power, His sovereignty, they are all on display for us to see without any relationship with God. And I believe that's intentional, that God would draw us to himself and want to be known by us in nature so that it would draw us into relationship with him. Now going back to my illustration of my husband. So some of you I know have had coffee with him, have had some sort of a connection, friendship, relationship with him. So if you go out for coffee with him, the first thing you might notice is that he drinks his coffee black He's a purist. He thinks strong black coffee is definitely the way to go. You will also notice if you were to go out to coffee with him, he's not going to order anything sweet because he doesn't really care about sweet things except for me. So <laughs> he, 
he will probably stick to his coffee. He's healthy. He's nutri- like he likes nutritious food. He likes to work out and keep fit. Those are things that you'll get to know as you talk with him. You'll also find out things that he likes to do in his spare time. I'm not going to list them all, but basically he loves aircraft, especially World War II planes. He loves history. He loves to play squash. He doesn't like to eat it. And those are things about my husband you'll know very quickly with a brief conversation. So as we open up the Word of God, God has revealed himself to us in his word. First, we looked at how he reveals himself in nature, and then how he reveals himself in the word of God. And he has, from the beginning of time all the way, so the Old Testament is all of his revelation to us before Christ, and then the New Testament is what is revealed of himself through Christ. And we're going to look at that more clearly in a moment. So when God reveals himself to to us in his word, we see that God is all-knowing, all-wise, faithful, merciful, just, all of these attributes, how he expresses himself to us, are on display through his word that he has given to us. Okay, so if we were going back to the illustration again of my husband, so there are a few people in this world who have had the privilege and the pleasure of having a close relationship with him in all of his complexities and wonderful um, uniqueness. See, I told you I'd say nice things. So, um, so if, you get to, if you have the privilege of getting to know him over a time period, so I've had the privilege of knowing him for the last 11 years, and it's been a journey of getting to know him better and better, and he would say the same of me. There have, other, there have been other people in his life, like his mom, his dad, his sister, his nephew. There's his friends from before our marriage, people that also know him in an intimate way because they have taken the time to get to know who he is. And that's a wonderful thing when you can develop a relationship with someone over time. So God, in a wonderful way, chose to reveal himself on earth in the form of his son, Jesus. He reveals himself to all of us through nature. He reveals himself to us in his word. And whether you know God or not, you can understand his attributes. You can understand God's character through his word, even without a relationship with him. But if you have a relationship with God, the word of God will come alive and beautiful. Now, when you have a relationship with God like the disciples had with Jesus, that is a face-to-face connection. It is an amazing, powerful thing when you can know someone face-to-face and walk with them and talk with them and learn from them in all their complexities. I believe that we would say that, um, you know, God is so vast, so mighty, so unknowable. What's the point? Why should we even get to know him? But I would say to you in that regard, that with marriage, for all the men in the room, would you not say that your wife is an enigma? Does any man really know everything there is to know about their wife? Do you know everything there is to know about your husband, or even your children, or your parents? We are all complex. And that is the way God has created us, uniquely complex. But that does not stop us from getting to know that person that means so much. Our love compels us to know who that person is and to know them intimately. And that is my desire for you and for myself as I've been studying God's attributes, as I've been studying for this message. There's been more and more revealed to me about who God is, and it is so exciting. I could take my entire life and read the word cover to cover. I could read every book on God's nature, and it would still, I would never know all that there is to know about God. But I know that God desires that I be like him, because that's what his word says. And through this message, this is part one of a two-part series called Like Him. And over the next two weeks, we're going to learn a little bit more about who this amazing God is and how he's called us to be like him. So we're going to go on a bit of a journey today. Let's look at a wonderful, um, let's look at a little, a wonderful quote by R.C. Sproul. This man, he just passed away last year, unfortunately, but he's a mighty man of God who's been a teacher, a professor, um, a study of God for his whole life. He wrote this book, The Holiness of God, and it's been amazing as I've been studying for this. He says this about God. He says, the tendency is to add to the idea of the holy to this long list. Sorry. I need to backtrack for a second. I didn't even talk about what attribute of God we were going to study today. We're going to talk about God's holiness. Holy, holy, holy. If that wasn't obvious. (laughs) Wow. Okay. We're talking about God's holiness today. Um, 
I am very aware of the fact that this topic has been misconstrued often in church, that we have had a list of do's and don'ts applied to this word holy. What I'm going to do today is I want us to start from scratch for a moment. I want us to erase every preconceived idea we have of God's holiness and God's nature. And I want us to just come boldly before him today and receive from him. So going to this wonderful quote by R.C. Sproul. The tendency is to add the idea of the holy to this long list of attributes. In other words, we've looked at God's sovereignty, his wisdom, his justice, his love. And we, t we tend to add it to a long list as one attribute among many of his attributes. But when the word holy is applied to God, it does not signify one single attribute. On the contrary, God is called holy in a general sense. So the word is used as a synonym uh, uh, for his deity. That is, the word holy calls attention to all that God is. This next quote will sum it up for you. He continues by saying, God's love is a holy love. His justice is holy justice. His mercy is holy mercy. His knowledge is holy knowledge. His spirit is holy spirit. Don't you think it's really amazing that of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, his spirit is called holy. I thought that was fascinating as I was studying this. Okay. For some of you, you're like, yeah, I already knew that. <laughs> okay, so I want us to look at, um, at a key here. The next key here is God's holiness is not merely a peripheral attribute. It is at the core of all that he is and does. I want us to remember this today. His holiness is at the core of all that God is. And I think at this point, it's really important to give you some form of a, a definition of what holy means. What we're trying to do here is we're trying to understand who it is that God is more fully and who it is that we worship. It is a mystery, but I think it's a, a mystery that is worth solving for the rest of our life, if necessary. So if we sum up the word holy here, I've taken this, uh, this definition from different sources. I've compiled notes from different authors, um, from dictionaries, from Bible definitions, and I've kind of summed it up into these five definitions here. Holiness is uh, the sum of all moral excellency. It is to be separate, to be set apart, to be sacred, to be possessing utter purity of character. Now, as a church, I believe that we have often focused on holiness as being about moral character and purity, and I have done that myself for many, many years. But I wanted to say here, the next key here, if we see holiness as simply something that we can achieve, a moral character or becoming righteous, we will begin to think that holiness is about us. It takes our eyes off of the one who is most holy and most pure and most separate. We begin to think in terms of doing right or doing wrong rather than becoming like him. And today I pray, my hope for each one of us is that we will have a desire to become like him. That we will take our eyes off of ourselves and realize this is actually not about us today. This is all about him. It's about his character. It's about learning to become like him, to reflect his glory to the world. And as we look at the word glory, as we've sung many songs about God's glory, his glory is just an ex external expression of God's holy nature. When we talk about glory, it's his holiness on display for us to see visibly. I just wanted to encourage you with that. God's holiness, his purity of character, his set-apartness, it distinguishes God, our God, from all others. He has no rivals. There is no other God called holy. The Greeks created multiple gods. They had a god of love, Aphrodite. They had a god of war. They had a god of harvest. But they did not have a holy god. Only we have a holy god. As it says in Exodus 15, 11, who else among the gods is like you, O Lord? Who is glorious in holiness like you? So awesome in splendor, performing such wonders. Who among the gods is like you? The answer is there is no one like our god. I love what John Piper says here. He says, God's holiness is his absolute uniqueness. God's holiness is his incomparableness. 
God's holiness is precisely the fact that there is none other. He is separate from all others. He, there is no one comparable. There is no one more morally righteous. There is no one more good or more pure than our God. And that should in itself make us excited about going and knowing who is this holy God that we serve and how can we reflect him? Is it even possible to be like him? And we're gonna find that the answer is yes. God desires that we become like him. If we look at God's holiness, as, as Piper says, he says, he's unique, he's incomparable, there is none other. And we think, wow. Well, if there's none other, then where do I fit in this picture? How can I become like him if there is no other? But I think we come back to the original dilemma of our, of our illustration with marriage and how we, we look at that person in our life who is so incomparable and different and unique, and there is no one like your spouse. There's no one like your child. They are so unique. And yet our love, again, our love compels us to know who it is that we love. And so that's what we're going to do today. We are going to look at... God's presence and how an encounter with God's presence affected us on earth. Because sometimes we, we, can, we can look at terms. I had a lot of terms. I had a lot of definitions prepared for you. And I just threw them all away. <laughs> and I decided, you know what? The best way to know about God's holy character and how it affects us is to look at examples of people who were profoundly influenced by encountering God's holy spirit or his holy presence. And there is a word for this. It's called a theophany. And that's literally just a visible appearance of God to man. So again, when I use the word theophany, this amazing Greek term, just think of, okay, God just appeared to man. That's it. And we're going to look at this example first, the example of Moses. Because Moses, in the book of Exodus, is known as a friend of God. And I thought, well, what is more intimate in nature than being called the friend of God? He experienced more visible attributes of God than others had seen in his time or since until the coming of Christ. He experienced God in such a profound way that I just had to start with him because in seeing how he encountered God, I believe that it will help us to understand how God wants to relate to us. So when we look at God, uh, when we look at the story of Moses, we look at how he led the Israelites out of slavery from Egypt and into the promised land. But there was a whole lot of stuff that happened between that time, which we're going to look at. But Moses' job was to help God establish a holy nation. The nation of Israel was not holy in itself. Nothing in itself is holy until God's presence touches that thing and makes it holy. He is the only thing the only one who is truly holy in himself and can make other things holy. We're going to talk about that as well in a minute. So when we look at Moses' task, first of all, of bringing people out of slavery and into freedom, I think that required an intimate encounter with God to be able to do something so profound. And to be part of God's plan to establish a holy nation, I believe that was also profound. And it required a little bit more of a relationship with God, a little bit more of a physical, visible nature of God's presence to make those things come about the way that they did. So this is a long list. I'm going to take you through Exodus 3 to 34 in a matter of minutes. So bear with me. I've made a chart which will hopefully sum this up. I am like a very strong J personality if you've done Myers-Briggs, and I like organization a lot. I hope you can read this, but if not, we're going to go through quickly because what I don't want you to do is look at this and feel like this weight. <laughs> what, I, what I did this for, I, you don't have to remember the details, you don't have to remember the verses or whatever. What I want you to get from this is basically how God showed himself physically, and then what was the result of that when people saw God face to face or an element of God. So we're going to look at those two things here quickly. Okay, Exodus 3, 5 to 6, we see that he, um, Moses is tending his father-in-law's sheep, and he sees on this mountain a burning bush, and the bush is not burning up, and he is curious. Who else is curious if they saw a burning bush and would run towards it? That was Moses. He goes towards that burning bush, and little does he know what is about to happen. He is literally about to meet with God. Whoa. Okay. So, he gets to the burning bush, and he hears this voice come out. And it says, Take off your sandals, for where you are standing is holy ground. 
Let's remember that that ground, that mountain, Mount Sinai, which is known as the mountain of God, the ground in itself is not holy. God's presence on that ground is what's making it holy ground. So just keep that in mind. So Moses, his reaction is he is afraid. There's no way I'm going to be able to read this screen. So (laughs) he hides his face. He is afraid of God. God has spoken in this booming voice. So there is a fear, a holy reverence. Removing his sandals was a sign of respect. Oh, thanks, guys. They just made it bigger. Awesome. Okay. I can do this. (laughs) Exodus 13, 21 to 22. Um, He has now led the Israelites out of captivity, out of Egypt. So we're jumping ahead. So in chapter 3, Moses received his call, if you will. God is calling him to lead the Egyptians or the Israelites out of Egypt and slavery into the promised land. So he's received his like big commission for life. He is fear and trembling all over. He is doubtful that he can even do it. He tells God like, I can't do this. I'm not even a good speaker. So God brings his brother Aaron along to help him in that task. But he has a lot of fear and doubt and insecurity. But then he's in Exodus 13, he's leading them out of Egypt and they are crossing the Red Sea. And in that process, God shows himself as a pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire. I just want you to remember those two things, pillar of cloud, pillar of fire. As you can see, you're gonna start to see trends of how God appears, okay? So then Exodus 19, one to 25, then, They are on the holy mountain. Now, God, they've come out of Egypt. They are camped out at the base of Mount Sinai. That's, again, the holy mountain of God. The Israelites are not holy enough at this point to see God or to experience God. Only Moses can really enter into the presence. So they're all camped out at the base, and um, Moses goes up and has a, a moment with God again. And so in this, God appears as thick cloud, as thunder and lightning, fire and smoke. The mountain shakes, the ram horns blow. Wow. (laughs) They were afraid. They did not know how to encounter a God like this. They're trembling. Um, Even just to, even just to be at that mountain, even just to be at the base, they needed to purify themselves and be washed and cleansed. There was a whole list of things that they had to do in order to even be near God's presence. So keep that in mind. Exodus 24, 9 to 18. They are still camped out at Mount Sinai and uh, this time there is leaders involved. So it's not, just, um, it's not just Moses that's with God. In uh, chapter 19, verse six, God says to Moses, you will be to me a kingdom of priests, my holy nation. So God is taking something that is unholy and he's making it holy. That's what all of this is for. Exodus 24, nine to 11, Moses, Aaron, and Aaron's sons, they go up along with 70 of Israel's leaders. They go up the mountain on Mount Sinai and they see God. And they say that they see under his feet a pavement of brilliant sapphire. That's how they see God visibly, as clear as the heavens. So Israel's leaders saw God in that way and he did not destroy them. In fact, and this is my favorite part, it says that they enjoyed a meal in God's presence. Does that sound ironic to you that we just had joined the table for the last four weeks? We were just learning about how Jesus shared a meal with everyone he came into touch with. That wasn't unique to Jesus. He is a reflection of God's character and God delighted in having a meal with these leaders, this holy nation that he was establishing. I think that's so beautiful. That would've been incredible to be there. So now we look at Exodus 24. God calls Moses up the mountain again. And look what we have here. We have clouds again. We have um, a pillar of cloud as God meets with Moses at the tent of meeting. The tent of meeting is where God met Moses, a tent, but it was a holy tent. The tent in itself was not holy. God's presence there made it holy. So we see that there. We see that the people would bow down next to their own tents because they couldn't get near the tent of meeting where God was. So they went to their own tents and they would bow low in respect and awe and reverence as Moses would meet with God. Then we have Exodus 33 and God makes all of his goodness pass before him. I wanted to read this to you. This is an amazing moment that Moses experienced with God. He's gone up the mountain. He's seen God face to face. He says, he says to God, or sorry, the Lord says to Moses, I will personally go with you to lead the people out. I will give you rest. Everything will be fine for you. 
Then Moses said, if you don't go with us personally, don't let us move a step from this place. Because if you don't go with us, how will anyone know that your people and I have found favor with you? How else will they know we are special and distinct from all other people on earth? Remember that to be holy means to be set apart, to be separate, to be sacred. They had to be different from all other people. And Moses recognizes the weight of this task of helping to establish a holy people. The Lord says, I will indeed do what you have asked, for you have found favor with me and you are my friend. Then Moses had one more request, just a little one. He says, please let me see your glorious presence. Let me see you face to face. Okay, did you catch that? The Lord replied, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will call out my name, the Lord, to you. I will show kindness to anyone I choose. I will show mercy to anyone I choose. But you may not look directly at my face, for no one can see me and live. So the Lord said, stand here on this rock beside me. As my glorious presence passes by, I will put you in the cleft of the rock and cover you with my hand until I've passed. And then I will remove my hand, and you will see me from behind, but my face you will not see. Moses saw a vision of God that no one else had seen in that moment. He had seen behind God. He had seen his glorious presence. He had seen all his goodness pass before him. What a moment. Okay, so now we have Exodus uh, 34. The Ten Commandments are given again because the first time they were given, Moses got angry. They made a golden calf, and they were like, really, you people, you made a golden calf, and we are here trying to be a holy nation? And you're going and doing the one thing God did not want you to do. And God is angry, and Moses is angry, and God actually wants to wipe them all out. And Moses is like, no, please, and he pleads on their behalf. No, God, keep this holy people, please. But, but Moses inside is like dying because he's already seen God's presence. He knows the goodness of God. And these people are making calves and images of God and idols. So Moses smashes the Ten Commandments that he had just written out by God's hands. He smashes them. So this is the second time that he gets the Ten Commandments. And Moses falls to the ground. He worships God. He asks God to pardon the sins of the people. And he asks to see God's glory. And he asks for acceptance as God's own special possessions. You're seeing, I hope you're seeing a trend. Moses is getting a little bit more bold. He's putting himself out there a little bit more every time. So we come to the final, Exodus 34, 29 to 35. And I know we've gone through all this quickly. I'm going to give you a really good summation at the end of all this. When Moses comes down off of Mount Sinai, the holy mountain of God, he has been in God's presence now for 40 days and 40 nights. He has not eaten or drank anything. He comes down the mountain where all the people are. He's carrying the new Ten Commandments, and his face is literally glowing, like glowing because he had spoken to the Lord face to face. And when the Israelites see his face shining and radiant with God's glory, again, the glory being the outward appearance of God's holy nature, they have to co- he has to cover his face in their presence because they cannot look at him. He is too radiant with God's glory. And he would continue to meet with God in the tent of meeting. Let me sum all this up for you because I know this is a lot. We've just gone through a lot of chapters. What I want you to take away from the story of Moses is, first of all, you can see clearly how God appeared in clouds, in smoke, in fire, in lightning. What a display of God's glory, if ever there was. I also want you to recognize that in chapter 3, Moses appears to God. He falls on his face in fear of God. By the end of the book of Exodus, he is pleading with God on behalf of a nation He has boldness. He has security in who he has been created to be as a holy people. He's asking forgiveness. He's asking God to remember his promises. And he's asking to see God face to face. He has been transformed, literally. Which is important because his task, again, was to bring people out of slavery and bring people to freedom. And that sounds an awful lot like the commission that God has given to you and to me. To bring people out of slavery and bring them into freedom. And in order to do that, In order for us to be a holy people, we need to be transformed by God's presence. And so I want you to remember, if you can remember one thing from all of this, remember that the key number one, we are to know him and we are to make him known. That is our goal. That is what God is doing in our lives. We are to know God, encounter him intimately so that we can make him known to the world. We're going to look at key number one. What happens when we encounter God's holy presence? 
There's four of them. This is number one. What happens when we encounter God's holy presence? One, an encounter with God will transform us from the inside out. That's what I wanted you to see about that whole story of Moses. He went from being shy, timid, insecure, doubtful, to a man of God who led people out of slavery into freedom. An encounter with God will transform you. Hold on to that. Okay, next we're going to look at Isaiah. We don't have a lot of time, so we're going (laughs) to rush through. Isaiah. We're going to look at Isaiah as the voice of God. Remember we looked at Moses. He was called the friend of God. Moses, I've called, or Isaiah, I've called the voice of God because he was literally to be God's mouthpiece. He was to be a prophet. And so we're going to look at chapter 6 quickly of Isaiah. You can open up. It's just one chapter. It's very quick. Isaiah is known as the greatest prophet of the Old Testament, and at the time of his commission, the Israelites, who Moses just spent so much time helping God transform into this holy nation, and they are now just deprived. They are sinning. They are sacrificing, but God does not delight in their sacrifices. God is not happy with the Israelites, and he has commissioned um, Isaiah to speak on his behalf. It's not a nice message either. So Isaiah has this weighty task in chapter 6. He's being commissioned, and I believe, again, when we look at Moses and and his need to be experiencing God's presence, we look at Isaiah, and he is now a mouthpiece of God. He is also leading them out of bondage and into freedom, as we are to do. And we look at this, Isaiah was known as the greatest prophet of the Old Testament. He is the one who declared Jesus more than anyone else. And that comes in very handy when we look at these examples. So let's look quickly. Isaiah 6, verse 3. First of all, Isaiah has seen this revelation of God, his presence. He sees him seated on the throne, high and lifted up. He sees the train of God's robe. This is a vision that he sees of God physically. Again, a theophany is the word. And so he sees a vision of God. And around God's throne, there are flying these seraphim, which is angels. These angels are flying around. Their hands and their feet are covered because they cannot look upon God either in his presence. And we hear them singing day and night. They say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty who the whole earth is filled with his glory. The whole earth is filled with his glory. His glory is an external expression of his holy nature. The whole earth is full of God's holiness. Now, we also see in Revelation, we're going to look at that in a second, there's a word. So you'll, you'll notice, some of you who are, you've read the Bible through, you'll notice that The word holy is the only word repeated three times in the Bible. It's called a trisagion. Don't have to remember that either, but there is a term for it. The trisagion is Greek for thrice holy. It just means holy, holy, holy. It is the only word repeated three times. Don't you think there's a reason why they would use the word holy three times? There's a weight on that word. There's something God wants us to receive. As we repeat that word, that's how they add emphasis in Bible, and as they're writing the Bible, the, emphasizing something, they might repeat a word two, or in this case, three times to add emphasis. So there's emphasis on the word holy. We see again, quickly, if you go to Revelation, Revelation 4, verse 8, again, the angels are in the throne room of God, and they're saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty, who was, who is, who is to come. We look at that emphasis. There's an emphasis there. There's something that I want to look at briefly um, when we go to the story of Isaiah. There's three more keys. We looked at how an encounter with God will transform us. There's three other keys here that I want you to notice about the story of Isaiah. When Isaiah comes before the throne of God, he is humbled. He comes in fear, as Moses did at that first encounter. His first response when he sees the angels, when he sees God's presence, in Isaiah 6-5, it says, He says, my destruction is sealed. In other translations, it says, woe is me. Woe is me. Here is God Almighty, and here is me. And he comes face to face with his lack of holiness. He comes face to face with his sin. He says, for I am a sinful man and a member of a sinful race. Yet I have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. As long as Isaiah, or as long as you and I, can compare ourselves to one another, we might stand some chance of feeling, not being, but feeling like we are doing pretty good, like we're okay when we compare ourselves to one another. 
But what happens when you come face to face with God Almighty, who is pure and holy? When you come face to face with God, you recognize your sin and your need for Him, and that He is the only one who can transform us. So key number two, an encounter with God will humble us. It sends us to our knees. But God does not leave us there on our knees in sin and shame. Here's what he does. Here's what he does to Isaiah. It says in Isaiah 6, verse 6 to 7, Then one of the seraphim, the angels, flew around the altar and picked up a burning coal with a pair of tongs. He touched my lips with it and said, See, this coal has touched your lips. Now, your guilt is removed and your sins are forgiven. This is the Old Testament, remember? Like, this is before Jesus. And he says, your sins have been forgiven. Amen? (laughs) God does not leave us undone. He removes our guilt. He forgives our sins. He shows us grace. Amen. So, an encounter with God will transform us. It will humble us. And it frees us from sin, shame, guilt, insecurity from anything that is holding us down, God will transform us, and He encounters us with His presence. His encounter with us will change us from the inside out and free us. Remember, the reason why Isaiah was having this encounter in the first place was because he was being commissioned as a prophet to the people, to the Israelites, to send a a difficult word to them. And they needed to have freedom that comes from God. So we look at verse 8 to 9. Then I heard the Lord saying, after he's been freed, he's feeling pretty good about himself now, he's free. He says, the Lord says, whom should I send as a messenger to my people and who will go for us? And I said, Lord, I'll go. Send me, please. He has gone from being timid and afraid to stand in God's presence to being released. He's been humbled and it's hard to be humbled But God didn't leave him there. He raised him up, and he freed him from sin and shame. And then God released him into the destiny that God had planned for him from the beginning as a voice. An encounter with God will transform us. It will humble us. It will free us, and it will release us into what he has called us to do, what our purpose is. That is what encountering God will do for you and for me. And that is why it is important to know who he is so that we can be a reflection of him. And so we can become like him so that we can have this encounter that will free us and release us as well. And now we come to the most pivotal moment of the morning. We've looked at Moses as a friend of God. We've looked at Isaiah as a voice of God. Now we are going to look at Jesus, the son of God. Jesus is the ultimate theophany. Do you remember what the word theophany means? The visible appearance of God to man. Jesus is God on earth. He is the visible image of an invisible God. He is with us. As it says in Matthew 1.23, she, Mary, will give birth to a son and he will be called Emmanuel, meaning God with us. Jesus is all of God's attributes in one human form. In Jesus, we see all of God's attributes on display. We see his, his uh, wisdom, we see his justice, his love, his mercy, and remember all of these things are holy. His love is holy, his justice, his mercy, they're all holy. God is with us in the form of Jesus. Again, in Colossians 1.15, he is the visible image of an invisible God. John 1.18 says that no one has ever seen God But his only son, who is God himself, is near to the Father's heart and has told us about him. God revealed himself fully in the person of his son. And what we see there is his disciples who saw Jesus and walked and talked with him and received from him. Jesus took ordinary men and women who were tax collectors and fishermen and former prostitutes. He took these men and women and he transformed them from the inside out. He brought them to a place of humility so that they saw their need for, they saw their sin. They were very aware of their sin, but 
he elevated them, he freed them, and he released them into the world. And these men and women took the message that Jesus gave them of transformation and of his holy presence. They took that message to the world, and they turned the world upside down. And God has commissioned each one of us to change the world, to be a reflection of his glory to the world so that we can transform them, so we can turn the world upside down. That is what we have been called to do. Encountering Jesus left his disciples transformed, humbled, freed, and released into their callings to make Christ known. This is a key. I I also want you to remember this. You'll see how I put a little key on there. When you see a key on there, it means please remember this and don't forget it ever. (laughs) Then the purpose, the purpose of every Christian is to make the invisible kingdom of God visible. That is your calling and my calling, is to make the invisible kingdom of God visible to all around us. In Jesus Christ, we see all of God reflected. Jesus Christ is our access. In Jesus Christ, he gives us access, not just to grace, but also to God himself. Jesus gives us access not just to grace, but to God himself, so that we can come before the throne of a holy God. We can stand there boldly because of what Christ Jesus has done in us. Can you imagine what would happen to this world if each one of us had this revelation of God's holiness? And if each one of us were to encounter this holy God, as Moses encountered him, as Isaiah encountered him, as the disciples of Jesus encountered a holy, risen God. Can you imagine what would happen in this world if we all had an encounter with him that changed us from the inside out? We would never be the same. This world would never be the same if we knew the position that we have as a holy people because of a holy God. The world would never be the same. It will never be the same when we catch hold of this. Next week, I'm going to be just in greater detail talking about how we can become holy. This week, I wanted to focus all of our heart and mind on God's holiness and what encountering Him will do in our life. But I want you to remember this. We all have access to the Father because of what Jesus did. We have all been given access to the Father through the blood of Jesus. We've been given access to the throne of God. Through the blood of Jesus Christ, we are made holy. Jesus has given us access. As it says in Hebrews 10, 19 to 22, I say this because I know that it's Lance's favorite verse, pretty much, in the Bible. And you'll hear him quote it over and over. He said it in the welcome because it's so profound. Let's Look at this in the, in the eyes of what we've just discovered about God's holy nature, and let's read it through those eyes. So, dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. This is the new life-giving way that Christ has opened up for us through the sacred curtain by means of his death for us, since we have a great high priest who rules over God's people. Let us go right into the presence of God with true hearts, fully trusting him. For our evil conscience has been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean. Our bodies have been washed with pure water. Again, we are not holy in ourselves, but when we have received the blood of Jesus, it cleanses us. It seems ironic that blood would cleanse, but it does because it's holy blood. The blood of Jesus, the perfect, spotless Son of God, died on the cross for you and for me so that we could be washed clean and pure and holy and made holy like Him. And He has given us that access through the blood to receive all of God's glory, to receive His power, His love, His might, His forgiveness of sin. I wanted to get just personal for a second because I have been a believer for most of my life, but I haven't always been bold or secure in who I am. But encountering God in moments, I've had moments where I've been on my knees, 
where I have had tears coming down my face because I am at the end of myself and I recognize my need for God. And I've had moments where I have been on my knees and I have felt his holy presence touch my whole life and change me from the inside out. He took this shy girl who was insecure, who had no friends, who couldn't speak out, and he took this shy little girl and he transformed me to be able to speak with boldness. That is God's holy presence in my life. That is not me. God took me and he humbled me at my greatest hour. He humbled me and placed me on my knees because he knew that I needed to get to that point to wipe away any pride in my heart, to forgive my sins, to wash me clean, to have me start afresh. And he humbled me, but then he freed me by the blood of Jesus. He transformed my whole life. And he has released me into what he has called me to do. He needed to bring me to that place of humility and freedom in order to, for me to be released. And God is going to do the same thing in every one of us who desires it. If you desire an encounter with God, he will transform your heart from the inside out if you desire it. You need to ask God to encounter him in your life if you haven't already. If you are looking to receive Christ, if, if what I'm saying here is resonating deep down inside, I want you to, when we come to the time of prayer, I want you to come before him and give him everything that you have, your whole life, and let him transform you from the inside out. My challenge for you today is to think on this. How has encountering God's holy presence changed your life? How has he changed you? And if you don't think he has, or if you, don't, if you have not encountered him yet, I want to give you an opportunity to do that in a moment after we worship, to pray and to release your life to him. Think on this, how has God transformed your life? And, he, and if you don't feel like he has, and if you're still waiting, I want you to either today or tomorrow or sometime when you go home, Think on these things. Think on God's goodness. Think on his character. Think on his holiness, who he is, and start that relationship. Continue growing in that relationship with him. We've talked about one attribute of God today, his holiness. That's it, one attribute. And I could talk about this for eternity and it wouldn't be enough. I am doing this to hopefully awaken in you the desire to know who it is that you worship and who it is you love and who it is we sing about on Sunday so you can have your own encounter with God. Philippians 3.8 says, I count everything as a loss compared to the worth, the passing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Everything else is nothing compared to knowing him. Knowing him is the focal point of our entire life. Nothing is more important than knowing him and making him known. So let's worship him right now. Oh, Father God, we thank you that you are in this place. We thank you that your Holy Spirit is here, filling us up, freeing us and releasing us into all that you've called us to do. God, I pray for those in the room who may not have encountered your holy presence, but God, I pray that you would encounter them now in this moment, in this holy place, at this holy time, that you would come and empower us and free us and release us, Lord. I pray that those who do not know you would come to an intimate relationship with you, that they would know you, that they be transformed by your presence, Lord, in our life. For those who want more, I pray over them right now that you would fill them so full that they would be overflowing with your glory and your power and your love, that they would display it for all the world to see, that we would be a true reflection of your glory and that we would live every single day of our lives with the desire to be like you and to reflect you to all that we come in touch with. I pray blessing over each one here as we go off to Thanksgiving, to meals. I pray that these words would be rooted in our hearts and our minds, that we would have the desire to know more about who you are every single day of our life. And I thank you for each person here, for the seed has been planted today in the hearts that is your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. 
want to encourage you all as we go off in Thanksgiving to remember the challenge here today. I pray it has blessed you and encouraged you. I pray it has sparked some good conversation over turkey dinner. I pray a blessing that each one of you would enjoy Thanksgiving with your families and have a truly wonderful weekend and go live a life that celebrates God. Amen.